No, I can't complain. Good day so far, but as you can hear, the noise has started. Oh, oh we're going to hear the clapping. Amazing. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Huh? Well, it's, yeah, it's, not, it's nice. It's very moving. To me, mm -hmm. it, was, it was very touching when I first heard that when I got out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. It was amazing because I was so moved by, by all this, by, by what the people did, the frontline workers. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Noam, you want to do the intro? Because I'm recording. Are you ready to uh, uh, launch this rocket, Noam? Why don't you do it, Periel? You, you can do the intro. No, oh, no Dan. Periel's not intro authorized. I hate Dan, Dan doesn't like it. <laughs> Dan is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead, Dan. Then I'll, uh, you want me to do it, Noam? Yeah, go ahead. This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of New York's world famous comedy seller on Sirius XM, Raw Dog 99. <laughs> here coming at you from lockdown in New York City. Noam Dorman is here. Noam, how are you? Oh, uh, yeah, you know. All right, great. You're really, uh, you're really uh, enthused. We have Nico White, who is a comedian, a comedy yes, color sir. comedian. Yes, and, indeed. Uh, and uh, Nico, well, he, uh, he, uh, Periel gave me an introduction. He's a New York City-based comedian. Oh. Album Marcellus, is that it? That's it. My album Marcellus, M A R S C E L L U S, will be out everywhere next Friday, May 8th. That's an interesting name. I guess we'll get to that mm -hmm. in a bit. And we yes, have sir. with us Jeff Gurian, who's been uh, on the show before. How do you do, Jeff? Hey, I'm doing good, Dan. I'm grateful to be here. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, and great to have you with us. Jeff Gurian is a comedian, radio personality, comedy writer, wrote for Roddy Dangerfield, Joan Rivers, George Wallace, and numerous others, author of six books, <laughs> including Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind. And he is a coronavirus survivor. He went to hell and came back to tell the tale, and we're anxious to hear his story. How, and Perry L, of course, is with us as usual. And Periel also had corona, she believes, although it hadn't been formally died. She didn't get tested. Bro, I was on a, I was on like one of, one of these with her and she was saying that she had it and I'm sitting there the whole time like, how are you doing this and you have it? you one of the strongest people I know, yo. No, well, she had a more, a more mild form of it, like Chris Cuomo, who was able to continue doing his CNN show uh, while he was uh, uh, battling coronavirus, but there's there's different uh, degrees and intensities. Of it. There's different strains of it, and there seems to be a lot of different symptoms. And now they came up with this uh, blood clotting thing that you can get blood clots in your legs from this, which is why that guy Nick Cordero had to lose his right leg. You know, the Broadway actor. You can get all kinds of different symptoms. Some people have a mild case. Some people have a very severe case. Wait, is Nick Cordero, what's, what, is he home or is he still in, in the ICU? I, I think he was, I think he's still in the hospital. I'm not sure, but I know he had to have his right leg amputated. And oh, they, they took the whole shit. Because, and because of uh, Corona, because of the Corona. Yo. Uh, now they're just- You're with us, you, you seem a little distracted. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who, me? No, Noam Dorman, Noam, hello, Noam. Hi, I was, no, I was just thinking about having my leg, ampu my leg amputated. <laughs> Right, man. This virus, this virus is a beast. No matter what you read about it, it's mm -hmm. worse. It's worse than you could ever imagine. It's seven, <laughs> seven weeks for me, and mm -hmm. I'm just close to feeling back to myself. But I still feel like there's something inside of me that's mm -hmm. hanging on, that's trying to make me sick again. I'm really right. scared. I'm really Jeffrey, scared. Jeffrey, is it possible for you to move closer to the computer? Yes. Is this better? Yeah, the closer, and you sound better too. So, okay. so, so this thing about Jeffrey. Jeffrey's had terrible luck because uh, three, three, four years ago, he was, our, he was on his deathbed another time when he, he almost dropped dead of a heart attack in midtown Manhattan, right? Or something like that. Yeah, exactly. But, in, but yeah. flipping that switch, it's actually that I have great luck because I had a widowmaker heart attack, which is a very serious heart attack, and I came mm -hmm. through it. And now I got this corona thing, and I was lucky enough to come through that also. Well, I appreciate your right. appreciate appreciate your half full uh, mentality, but um, I would say I wouldn't want your good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I have no choice. Yeah. It could have gone either way, you know. It could have gone either way, but so I very have to quickly, just to look at it. 
I just said this. So you were you were walking down Midtown Manhattan, and you died, and the cops and the cops uh, saw an ailing, uh, a wealthy white man in front of them, and they didn't want to help you, right? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't die. What happened was I was getting pains in my chest, and I right. had a chiropractor, and it was pouring rain, and I don't like to go out in the rain. It sounds stupid, but I don't like to go out in the rain because of my hair. Sounds really dumb, but I decided I was going to go anyway, right? Yeah. And I, I had to take the subway. And as I was going, this pain in my chest was getting worse. And I kept rubbing it. And for some reason, when I rubbed it, it felt better. And I thought to myself, you can't rub away a heart attack. So maybe uh. it's not that. Maybe it's something muscular. But as I was on the subway, it, st- it was getting worse and worse and worse. And I got out of the subway on 49th, near Sirius. And I had to walk a few blocks. And for some reason, I don't know what made me do it. I turned down 50th Street and the pain was getting very intense. So there was a police van there with four cops in the van. So I knock on the window and I said to the cop, I'm sorry to bother you. Oh, and it's pouring rain. So I have an umbrella. Sorry to bother you, but I think I'm having a heart attack. And the cop says to me, well, I think you should go to the hospital. (laughs) And I was like, well, that's why I'm telling you. I'm not just telling everyone. No. All right. Is it is it possible because you didn't want to get your hair wet? He thought you were black. It, black it, well, <laughs> a lot of people think I'm black because of it. it's just the lighting. I can't. Yeah, tell you. yeah, that that's definitely what it is. It's the lighting, bro. I can't tell you how many people confuse me with Dave Chappelle. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I thought they were going to say jump in and they put the siren on and take me to the hospital. But that's not what happened. The guy says to me, we're stuck in traffic. It'll probably be faster if you walk. (laughs) So I said, well, well, where's the nearest hospital? And he didn't know. None of the cops, four cops, no one knows where the hospital. So he takes that. That's that's what you paying your tax dollars for, man. So listen, he takes out his phone and he starts looking for hospitals and he says to me, do you have Google Maps? And you got a picture of him standing in the rain with an umbra- pouring rain and he's asking me if I have Google Maps. So I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, you should probably download Google Maps. <laughs> this cop is the greatest, yo. That's when I walked away. I, w- I literally walked away. I'm like, this is too bizarre. It's a fucking Woody Allen movie. I tell the guy I'm having a heart attack. He tells me to download Google Maps. But I could only get another half a block because the pain got really intense. So there's a second cop <laughs> and he's on a walkie talkie and he's directing traffic. And I do the same thing to him. But for some reason, I'm very calm. And I think maybe this is why nobody panicked. And I said to him the same, I'm sorry to bother you. I think I'm having a heart attack. And he said to me, well, stand on the side here. So I stand on the side and a couple of minutes go by and I said to him, are they coming? And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't call them yet. And I'm like, what's the story? Nobody really is upset that I'm having a heart attack. So he finally calls had them. They, had they seen your act, Jeffrey? <laughs> Maybe that was it. Maybe that was it. But I, I, for some reason, I was really calm. So a fire engine pulls up because very often they come to the scene first because they're all EMT. Yeah. So four or five firemen get off the truck. I walk over. The guy says to me, who's the patient? And I said, me. He said, well, climb up on the truck. I said, really? He's like, nah, we're just fucking with you like that. <laughs> Even these how guys are a joke. So finally, how long did it take for the heart attack to hit? It was hitting. already in the midst. I was having the heart attack, but nobody knew. They even, Yo. They took the ambulance, finally an ambulance comes and they take me in and they take off my shirt and they hook up an IV because they got to do that right away. And they sit there asking me stupid questions. They're taking my medical history. Instead of driving me to the hospital and asking me the questions while they're going, they, they insist on doing it while they're there. And I said, I know that you can take, I know that you can take a medical history while we're going. And I'm arguing with the guy. He's actually nasty. and like starting an argument with me. No, we have to do it now. And he's asking me stupid questions like, did you ha- have an uncle that felt nauseous? I'm like, that's ridiculous. So they finally start driving me to the hospital and they don't put the siren on. And I'm like, why aren't you using the siren? And they're like, you don't, right. <laughs> you don't fall within the parameters of a siren. We have certain protocol. We're not sure you're having a heart attack. It turns out that the kind of heart attack I had doesn't show on an EKG. Mm. So they're driving very slow. They're stopping at all the lights. 
Oh my God. Meanwhile, you just in the back dying. Right, and they try to convince me that it's safer for me. They said, if we, put, <laughs> if we put on a siren, we have to go through the lights and it's raining really hard and we could get into an accident. So it's better for you that we drive slowly. Then I feel something squirt on my cheek, right? I agree with Noam. I wouldn't want your luck, man. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, this... I feel something squirt on my cheek. So I said, what was that? And the guy's like, nitroglycerin. I'm like, it's supposed to go under your tongue, not on your face. And the guy's like, well, that's close enough. So they finally get me to, to the hospital. Oh, no. oh. I have the musical accompaniment. The background music, is it too loud? Yes, turn that shit off. Yes. They finally get me to the hospital, and they wheel me out into the pouring rain, and the doors that are supposed to fly open won't open. They can't get oh. the doors open in the emergency room. And I'm like, this is insane. This is really like a Woody Allen movie. It's ridiculous. That's God. God wanted you that day, bro. The guy had to climb up on the door and open the door manually in order to get me in there. And then I laid in the emergency room for nine hours having a heart attack. What saved me was some, some genius emergency room doctor started me on a blood thinner. And that must yeah. have been save me because they didn't have a room for me until midnight this was three in the afternoon until midnight i laid in the emergency room the next day was the first time a cardiologist ever came to see me and that's when they told me how serious it was they said i was 95 percent blocked in the major artery to my heart and it was an emergency <laughs> you're supposed to do it within 90 minutes if you know that but they did yeah. it the next day and I, some genius went into my heart through my arm and put in a stent and saved me. And five days later, I was back on stage. Can you believe yeah, it? I, how bad did it hurt when the stent went in and they opened it up? I've, I've read that can be very painful. Yeah. Well, that's a crazy thing, too, because I remember I was on the table. They give you some kind of uh, anesthesia, but you're still awake. It's like a twilight sleep. And I remember I was joking with the guy on the table. I said to I felt what they were doing. They moved the ah. in and out of your heart <laughs> to unblock it. And I said to the guy, I feel you in my heart, not in a romantic way, but I feel you in my heart. And I remember saying that to him and he said, I'll give you more anesthetic. And after that, I don't remember anything. But he put, around, he put your ass to sleep. Around five o'clock in the afternoon, he came to my room and he hugged me and he said, I want you to know you're a miracle. And I was like, you're the miracle. You're the one who saved me. Oh, so, uh, you, you, you went the full Bernie Sanders. You had a heart attack five <laughs> years later. You're back on stage. Exactly. And I don't, you think, what else? You know, I, that's it. I've been pre disaster like in Garp. You know, I'm done. I'm good. I'm good now. And then, it's, hard to, it's hard to get spots. The coronavirus comes and mm -hmm. you line up right first. You first one to how did you how do you think you got this thing? Where'd you get it and what happened? What tell us the coronavirus story? The coronavirus story is insane. I was trying to, to carry on my usual thing. Like, uh, I got sick on March 11th. So on March 7th, I did my podcast with Ron Bennington from Sirius XM. And then the next day I went to see Seinfeld at the 92nd Street Y and the auditorium was packed. And they were already warning people about going out and getting into groups, but they weren't doing social distancing yet. I was already a little nervous but I went anyway because I had these tickets that were sent to me and I went. And then on Tuesday. Nico, I know what you're thinking, but it's not because he's Jewish. He just, he loves Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> he read my mind, bro. I know I did. I saw it. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, on Tuesday, we went out shooting video interviews with different people for a, a project. And the next, and then I went to, uh, uh, a National Lampoon show. That was the last thing I did. And at that night, I was really nervous already, but I went. People were already not shaking hands. They were fist bumping. Mm -hmm. And I went out and I bought a lot of food that night. I, it was a lucky thing I did. There was a Trader Joe's nearby and I went out and stocked up on food. Then the very next day, I got sick. And I thought it was a cold at first. I was just sneezing and coughing. On the third day, which was Friday the 13th, Oh, God. I started, feeling it. it was crazy. I started feeling it in my throat. And when I get a cold, I always get a sore throat. And I, I keep z pack in the house. Mm -hmm. And I started myself on z pack And I really believe that that's what saved my life. 
because I took two full courses of it. I stayed on it for 10 days, not knowing that that's what they're using in the hospitals. They're using black widow and z pack and zinc. So mm -hmm. I stayed on it for 10 days thinking I'd get better, but I, st I was getting sicker every day. And I had unbelievable symptoms. The only symptom I didn't have was losing my breathing. Mm -hmm. And I really think that that's what the z pack did. I had a fever of 102.4. I had nausea 24-7 from morning to night. It never left, no matter what I took. And nausea, to me, is so horrible. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm a real emetophobe. Oh, for you, the love of God, I wish you guys had to fucking be pregnant for five minutes. Well, that's what I used to think of. <laughs> you know, I, I thought of that because I was, I was so nauseous. And I usually take Dramamine and that helps. It didn't help at all. And usually when you're nauseous, you can throw up and it goes away. But with this yeah. virus, I couldn't throw up. It didn't let me throw up. It just kept me nauseous. The fever, I had- Have an abortion. <laughs> <laughs> Have an abortion, no go. I didn't think of it. I didn't think of it at the time. I, I had night sweats. And usually after night sweats, the fever breaks. But not right. with this virus. You get, you get night sweats and the fever comes back. I had full body pain. I had such chills, I couldn't hold the glass. My whole body was shaking. When I got to the hospital, they had to put four blankets over me to try and get my, my uh, no, so I would feel warm. Jeffrey, but, yeah. I don't check people into the hospital, uh, even, even if you're pretty sick. What, were your, what was the symptom that, um, that warranted you an ICU bed? Um, well, and, and it's good that you asked that because when I finally called 911, I lasted for 14 days and then I couldn't take it anymore. And I'll say this not to be dramatic, but I literally <laughs> felt suicidal after the 14th day. Yeah. I was praying for God to take my life. And I, I would never say something like that. It was horrible. I was so sick and so weak. I, couldn't, I was dragging myself from room to room. And there was no relief. Sometimes if you're sick, you could find a cool spot on the bed where you're comfortable for a few minutes. This was nonstop pain. Too bad you didn't have some other concert tickets you would you would have paid for. And I could have gone to. I right? had a will get a reason to live. I could. Oh, so I knew the next day I'd have to dial nine one one. So I got up that morning. I don't know how I made it through that night, and I realized I I, I couldn't even get dressed. And I'm like, open at night. Pardon me. Nine one one's open at night. You could have called them at night as well. It's, it's so scary to go to hospital at all. I don't know if you ever had the experience, but I didn't want to go to the hospital in the middle of the night. Yeah, that was even scarier. Plus, you don't know who's on duty in the middle of the night. It's usually not physicians with a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. So I I wanted to wait till the morning, and so I took a shower. And what do you wear to go to the hospital? I so I realized I had to wear stuff that would come off easily. Yeah, like Periel getting ready for a date. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff that comes off easily, right? So, <laughs> so I put on track pants and I put on a, a t-shirt and a sport jacket so I could put my wallet someplace. And I was, a sport jacket. I couldn't think straight. I actually put on cologne. I was so confused. I didn't know what to do. And then I realized I had to pack a bag. What do you take to go to the hospital? I, I was really confused. So I Googled, what, what do you take to go to the hospital, right? So I packed mm -hmm. the bag. I called 911 and they said, what are your symptoms? When I told them my symptoms and that I had a history of a heart condition. And then at, by that point, I was bleeding from my nose. Like just- What? When, when did that start? That, it started that morning. I blow my nose, just, just red blood flowing out of my nose. Oh my what God. the fuck? And they said, they said, we're coming for you. And as I recall, they came pretty quickly. And I said, I'm, leave, I'm leaving my door open. And they were very impressed that I was able to get on the stretcher by myself. They said most people were not able to do that. These two guys mm -hmm. came that were so nice. And this yeah. guy, he took my hand and he said to me, don't worry, you're gonna be okay. Aww. And that meant so much, because when you're that sick and someone says something even so simple, it really makes a big difference. And they strapped me in and they put like two masks over me, went with a big shield mm -hmm. and they, they got me in the freight elevator and they wheeled me into the ambulance. And I said, can you take me to Lenox Hill? Cause that's where my cardiologist is. And they're like, no, it's too far. We're taking you to NYU Langone, which worked mm -hmm. out so perfectly because I used to teach at NYU and they were using Plaquenil in a study. A lot of hospitals didn't even have that drug. So they took me to the emergency room. Uh -huh. 
and I laid there for hours and they put me in a cubicle and right next to me was a woman who was screaming with every single breath that she took. Literally, no exaggeration, every breath was a scream. And I had to flip that thought because it was driving me insane. I had to realize how scared she must have been, you know? So I laid there for a long time. My blood pressure had dropped to 42. You know how they usually say 120 over 80? Mm -hmm. my, my 80 was 42. So Gee. my pressure was so low that it was hard for them to find a vein to do an IV on me. They finally yeah. had oh. my hand. I know, it's horrible. And then yeah. after a few hours, they came in, they did a chest X-ray and an ultrasound of my lungs. And a pulmonary specialist came to see me and he said, you have double pneumonia. You have COVID double pneumonia. And that kind of freaked me because I knew I had the virus, but pneumonia is a scary word. Yeah. And they put me on oxygen, which they kept me on for another day or two. Uh, and I can't they, were debating, like they were debating whether to send me home or not. And I literally begged them. I said, please don't send me home. I can't do it anymore. I'm, I live alone and I mm -hmm. just can't do it. And so after they got the pneumonia diagnosis, they, they agreed to keep me. And they found a room and they wheeled me upstairs to this amazing room. It was such a beautiful room, but I was too sick to appreciate it. It was a room that they used for cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And they took all the cancer patients and moved them somewhere else. And they created a COVID wing. And I was yeah. in an isolation room. You know, no one was allowed in except one uh, member at a time, like one nurse or one doctor. They couldn't allow more than one person in at a time. Yeah. And they covered me with ice packs on my, on my head, under my arms, on my legs to try to bring my fever down. And they really took care of me. They nursed me back to health. You know, it was like an amazing room with a view of the East River and a TV. I never saw a TV this big. It was the size of the whole wall. And you could order food, you could watch TV, you could control the lights and the drapes or whatever. And I stayed there for two and a half days until they told me that they had to move me. And when they moved me, I didn't want to go because I was still really sick. But they said, we need the room for sicker people. So mm -hmm. they moved me to a room that I had to share with three other very sick men. And yeah. that, was, that was a nightmare. That was so horrible to share a room with everyone around you is so sick. The man next to me in the bed next to me was an elderly Chinese man who didn't speak English. And he was choking on his own saliva so bad that I was calling the nurse on his behalf because he couldn't speak. I thought yeah. he was dying and he was coughing into the air and he's right next to me. And I'm so sick. I'm concerned for him and I'm worried that I'm going to breathe in these germs. Yeah. And it was, it was just, it was worse than anything that I could even express. It's hard to explain. But when they told me that they were going to let me go the next day, I didn't feel well enough to go home but I didn't feel like I could stay there any longer because they were so overwhelmed. There were people in the hallways that didn't have rooms. Yeah. And sometimes it took more than two hours just to get Tylenol because they were just so overworked and so overwhelmed. And you couldn't lose your patience because you had to be grateful for the fact that you were there and that people were taking care of you, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, on that Sunday, they told me they wanted to discharge me uh, before noon. And by 2 o'clock, no one had come yet. Finally, at 3.30, an ambulance crew came for me. They wrapped me like a mummy. They tied my arms down. I don't know why they did that. They wrapped me up. They actually covered my face. And I said, please uncover my face. If you wheel me into my building, it'll look like I passed away, you know? Mm -hmm. They put these, like, elaborate masks on me. And they took me home, and they were so nice, and they wheeled me into my apartment. And then when they saw all the pictures of the, the comedians, they wound up hanging out for about 20 minutes, asking me, <laughs> asking me stories about all the comics that they love, you know? Yeah. And, and after Wait, I got home... Can you just backtrack to the part where you were wrapped up like a mummy and couldn't move your arms? <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't let me, and I, like, I couldn't touch my face. I, I was sneezing. I couldn't move. I, I, I was literally they, down, and I don't know why they did that. Did you, did, did you ever ask? I, I didn't ask anything, you know? I, they, I was in such a, I was in such a state. Like that? Pardon me? 
they took you home in an ambulance wrapped up like that? Yeah, yeah. And then they, they wheeled you me. into your apartment wrapped it's up my, like that? Yeah, uh-huh. I yeah, can understand I, having your face covered. That makes face. sense. They opened up the thing over my face, and I just had this, like, two masks on. Mm -hmm. and, you don't uh, start being nice. I'm going to do that to you, Noam. <laughs> <I empathize. laughs> uh, he's Mary liable to enjoy it you never know right? he got back home and and then uh you suffered again in uh in solitude for a few days oh for a long time i developed something called pleurisy which is an what? of the lungs uh i had to go back on z pack again about a week after i was home you know just they sent me home because they needed the bed, not because I was perfect. Right. They get you to a point where they think you can function on your own. They tested, they took out my oxygen to see how I would do on my own. And my oxygen was 95 to 96%, which they said was amazing, considering what I had. Mm -hmm. they, had me, they had me walk back and forth to see if my oxygen level dropped. Like one guy in my room, this Orthodox Jewish man, they had to rush him to a ventilator. His oxygen drops suddenly from 93 to 80. And that's what that virus does. It hits you like really quick. All of a sudden you're breathing fine. And the next thing it, you can't breathe at all. So mm -hmm. they took me off the oxygen. And as I said, about a week later, I developed pleurisy. So every time I took a breath, I had a sharp pain in my back and my shoulder. So I went back on the Z pack. And after a few days, that went away. But the, the, the tiredness, I think, first of all, I think I have PTSD from everything that I went through. April is yeah. really like a blur. I don't remember any days in between. I've been just trying to stay up late so that I can sleep for the whole night. Mm -hmm. you know, I have to sleep with my legs elevated because I have swelling. And I think that's from this too. I bought a special pillow to keep my legs higher, you know, when I sleep. Um, how, old, how old are you, Jeffrey? Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew we wasn't going to get that. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't own an age. Once you own an age, you're responsible for that age. So nobody knows how old I am. But I'm old enough that I, I'm in a I high risk. I don't know how old you are, but what, what year were you born? <laughs> nobody knows that either. Around 1810. <laughs> no, Believe no, no, me. How, old you, how old were you in the Beatles when you watched the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show? The Ed Sullivan show. I was a kid, but I remember that night very well. All right. Okay. We're getting, we're getting, you remember that night? Okay. If you're, if you're really curious, Wikipedia night. has an age for Jeffrey that may or may not be accurate. 60. No, it, it's not accurate. But you know what? It's, it's even in my book. Age is just, it depends on when your parents had sex. And I, I don't, I just don't own an age because once you do that, really, then people expect a certain thing from you. You fall into a category. Everybody wants to put people in categories. And I'm so much against that. You're doing really it right so far. You survived a heart attack and COVID so far, dog. So exactly. I ain't going to tell you no so different. I'm doing. Yeah. So I, you know, that's my true feeling. I don't say that as a joke. I really believe that that you don't categorize yourself that way. I'm just Good who enough. I am. I would be shocked if you didn't so anyway, have I, 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 But considering so, but what I, you went through. Yeah. It, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's amazingly, amazingly stressful. But I, I, I also wanted to thank you all for your messages of support. You were all kind enough. Nico, you oh. were in that video. And mm -hmm. Dan sent me a message. I know him, you sent me such nice messages of Periel. And I gotta tell mm -hmm. you that that really helps. When you're that sick and you know that people are thinking about you, I believe very strongly in the power of prayer and the power of thought. I yeah. really do. When, when that many people are focusing their energy on you, I really think it helps because it helped me a lot. As sick as I was, I couldn't answer most of them for a, a, quite a while. I couldn't, until I got home, maybe like a week or two later, I couldn't even sit at the computer. That's how drained I was. The point, I, I was making this point just the other day. I was talking with Noam and some people. I don't know if it was the podcast or, yeah, I think it was the episode we did with, uh, with all the, uh, the intellectuals, the last episode we did with uh, Coleman and uh, Tyler and, 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 uh, and um, Yasha. But I said that even, I said that uh, the virus, even if it doesn't kill me or if it doesn't kill you, it can put you through hell. Yeah, man. 
So we, it's not just focusing on the death rate, which they say is whatever it is. And now they say maybe it's uh, 1% or 2%. They really don't know, but or rather, I'm sorry, 0.1%. Uh, they say it might be that low. But the death rate is only one element of this. The, you also have to look yeah. at the people that a might have permanent damage. B might have gone through a terrible experience that could leave them, in your case, with 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 psychological uh, issues. Uh, you know, with PTSD. Or just who the hell wants to be that sick for two weeks, even if you survive? So, th those are considerations. I'm actually, I'm actually afraid to leave the house. I really am. I can't picture going out into the street. That's how. That's how and it affected me because because no one knows afraid. whether you can be infected or not. Uh, the the the, the yeah. hospital called me what? to see how I was doing, and okay, I, I asked second. them. Excuse me, Perry. Oh, I was talking sorry. to her kid or something, or her husband. I oh, oh, sorry. The hospital Perry, called me to see how I, like I was doing. I'd like you to familiarize yourself. I'd like you to familiarize yourself with the keyboard shortcuts for muting the microphone. The mute button. Yeah, is a mute. Go ahead. Uh, I I asked the hospital if it's possible to be reinfected, or if I have immunity. And they said, to tell you the truth, we don't know. It's too soon. Nobody really knows. And that was not really reassuring. Yeah. So as I said, I still feel, I don't feel great. I feel like there's something inside of me that's still hanging on. And from what, I've, from, from what I gather from people who've had pneumonia before, that there's a long recovery process. It doesn't go away quick like a cold. That it lingers. There's fluid in your lungs and there's germs in there. You know, when I was so sick, I would close my eyes. I'd see black spots, like, all over the place. And I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but I never had that before, and I don't have it now. But every time I would close my eyes, I'd see these, they look like corona spots to me, floating all over the place. Just really weird. And just... By the way, uh, Vic Henley died of a nobody, pulmonary embolism that... Oh, man, to yeah. be COVID related. I'm wondering because you had mentioned blood clots, Jeff. If uh, if it yes, might it have could, been, it, could have been COVID it, it might have been for sure because they weren't even talking about it. Now that people are talking about it, they're they're coming up with statistics of of uh, of how it could have been happening in the past couple of months and nobody knew. So it's very possible that that was related to that and that nobody checked. And and again, I don't know what the big thing is about testing. If, if you go to get tested and they tell you you're positive, what are you supposed to do? There's still, right. no, treatment. There's still no treatment for it. some weird feedback. Uh, yeah, the mic there's, is still, there's still no treatment for it. I don't understand this big thing where they want everybody to be tested. Well, because I think if, if they test people, that first of all, that'll give you information as to the death rate, and it'll also mm -hmm. allow you to quarantine those who are asymptomatic but infected. I, I think that everyone should just assume that they've been exposed to it and just mm -hmm. stay by yourself for a while. You can't right. take a chance. Not all those tests are effective, by the way. You know, right. there, are people, there are people who have had this virus who still tested positive afterwards. Not everyone tests mm -hmm. negative once it's over with. So because it's such a new thing, I think it's better to just assume that you have been exposed and just protect mm -hmm. yourself. Don't feel exactly like you're the immune. Exactly the opposite right. of some other viruses, like HP, where you assume everybody's been exposed, don't take any care at all. Yeah, well, yeah. fat. But, so, uh, but there, are people, there are people that say it's, it's time to reopen. And if we do that, we will need to test to make sure that we can, we can quarantine those who are uh, contagious and symptomatic, or asymptomatic, but contagious. Mm. Yes, yeah, I was going to say, the reason that you have to test is because you, you need people's morale to go up in some type of way. People need peace of mind again. So when they hear those numbers, they feel a little better. Because so far, it's been kind of good news. People are definitely traumatized. Nobody yeah. who is alive now has experienced this kind of stress. In a crazy way, it's bringing the whole world together because everybody is fighting this yeah. thing in every country in the world which is a really weird way to bring people together. There's a fracture but now. People it, are brought the whole world together. it brought the whole world Pardon together. I, first, it did bring the world together, but now there's a fracture between those who say, open things up. Elon Musk just tweeted today. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but he just tweeted about, you know, it's time to 
to liberate the country or something like that. I mean, I wonder why they would even say that when it's still so soon or right in the midst of it. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what evidence they're using to say that. And, and who is he? He's certainly not a medical expert. I would certainly defer to medical experts before I would listen to a business guy. It doesn't make sense. If you were, if you, God forbid, you went through what I went through, you wouldn't be in a hurry to mix with a group of people. Right. It's, it's going to take a while. I, my personal feeling is that it's going to take a while. It's not disappearing right away. Mm. And, you know, as hard as it is to quarantine, at least people are doing things like this, you know, so you don't feel totally alone. It's very hard to be alone for such a long time. How much TV mm. can you watch? When I was, you know, you tend to get bored when you're well, when you're sick, mm -hmm. it's a whole other story. Just day passes into night, passes into the next day. It's like Groundhog Day almost. You don't even know where you are. It's the same thing over and over and over again. Now, now, the scary yeah. part. You go ahead. No, just saying, it's just, it's a nightmare. People can't picture it. And anybody who thinks it's a hoax or it's, there's stupid people who are not mm -hmm. taking protective measures they're really taking a very big chance. It's a very, very dangerous virus. Nothing, it's right. like nothing like I've ever experienced. To be sick is now seven weeks and I'm not back to myself. You know? Right. I'm, See, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Harlem. I was saying, I'm in Harlem. The mood about it up here is kind of different. Like people have been staying inside for the most part, but I just went to 125th yesterday and you can see it. In some people's eyes, they're kind of sick of being scared of this thing, and they're tired of being at home. So it's not like it, it's not like it would be normally, but you could definitely see people starting to come out. Some of the old people that were super scared and not moving at all, they're like, okay, I deserve a walk. You're seeing more people out, and I'm afraid it might get nicer, and people straight up might stop giving a fuck about social distancing. Well, it's very hard because the statistics show that it's hit the Black and Latino communities Harder oh, you got to tell me. You got to tell me. I know. That's my so, inside now. So that's, you know, I think people need to be made aware of that, not to mm -hmm. take advantage. As You know, it's better to be bored than to be sick. Mm -hmm. Perial's experience was a bit... Yeah, I was talking about just people. <laughs> to say the least, Perial, your experience wasn't quite that extreme. Uh, you know, you had some... Uh, you, had, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't smell and uh, you had some fever. I actually didn't have fever, although I would like to say that I sent Noam, um, and I think you, Dan, an email earlier this week that um, nobody responded to, that the Wall Street Journal just came out with six new symptoms, which were all the symptoms what that are I they? had, right? So I didn't have a fever, but I did lose my sense of taste and smell. I had horrible headaches. Mm. I was extremely weak and achy and fatigued. Those um, aren't new. I read about those a month and a half ago. No, this <laughs> is an article that came out last week. Or this the article week. might have come out this week, but those particular symptoms I read about quite some time ago, and I never doubted that you had COVID. What I said was is you weren't I did. I still do, but go ahead, go ahead. Like she was never formally diagnosed with a test. She was diagnosed based on her symptoms. So it's not 100% mm. certain. But in any case... Well, I felt uh, very vindicated by that article. I have a question I want, to ask. I want to ask all of you. Do all of you have a good thermometer? Yes. I ordered a thermometer uh, along with a pulse oximeter to test my oxygen about two weeks ago on Amazon when I was at the height of my fear. Um, yeah. It still has not arrived yet. I'm assuming Amazon is so busy delivering shit that they didn't have time. But it's two weeks late. Maybe I weeks tried to order then. something. I, I know I tried to order something on Amazon, and they said it'll arrive there June eighth. And I'm like, forget it. Well, what, what, what good is it going to do you in June eighth? June eighth. But uh, the reason I ask is because I felt so stupid. I didn't have a working thermometer. I had a thermometer from the Middle Ages. It must have been like my great. <laughs> My great grandmother would have used it in Russia, one of those glass thermometers with mercury in it that you had to shake. Those down. are the most accurate. Those are the most accurate. I couldn't read it. It was horrible. Jeffrey, when I got you stick one. You couldn't read it. 
You stick one of those in your ass, believe me, you know your temperature to, to the tenth of a percent. Right? <laughs> really, those, those are the most accurate thermometers. That's still um, a scary thing for me. For what what, what but, was your worst? What was your worst symptom? The, the most, the, the most uh, uncomfortable or difficult uh, symptom for you, Jeffrey? For me, for me, I think it was the constant nausea and pain in my head. Uh, it just didn't let up. It didn't stop because when I first got to the emergency room. That's what I was begging them for. I said, please just do something to take away the nausea. And they gave me a pill. It takes a long time, by the way. When you're in a hospital and, they, and you ask for something, they have to requisition it. They don't just reach for a pill and give it to you. They have to get permission from a doctor. And that can take anywhere from an hour to two hours from the time that you ask. So they gave me something called Zofran, which yeah, worked for a very short time. But they wound up using Reglan on me, which they give to cancer patients because cancer patients are very often nauseous from all the stuff that they get. They gave that to me IV, and that seemed to work better. Uh, my worst uh -huh. symptom, I'd have to say, was probably the nausea and the headache, the pain in my head. It just wouldn't stop. And, and did you take Tylenol and that didn't work for you? I took, I took extra strength Tylenol around the clock. It did nothing by itself. I, I'm and with you. I have mortal fear of nausea, and that's the that's it's such the a horrible feeling when you can't get rid of it. You guys, I tried to throw up so many times, but they gave me a thermometer in the emergency room, and I carry it with I carried it with me wherever I went because a lot of times they wanted to take my temperature, and the nurse didn't have one, and I said, "Here, you can use mine." It was amazing. I got a digital thermometer. I'm in the Do, 20, I'm do in they the make 21st century? What's Did they make you have to tell um, like other people in your building that you had it or anything like that or no? No, my doormen know. They know I haven't left the apartment. They've been leaving stuff for me in front of my door. Right. I have a neighbor who's been such an angel. She shops for me every couple of days Aww. and leaves, you know, she just asks me what I need and shops and she leaves bags of food in front of my door, which is That's so- That's great, man. People have been so kind. My own super, the super of my building, went out to get me stuff, Dramamine and Gatorade, before I went to the hospital. Yeah. He gave me his cell phone. He said, if you ever need anything, let me know. And I didn't yeah. want to bother him, but I had no choice. Now, I'm uh, assuming, yeah. Jeffrey, this year at Christmas time, the tips to your doormen are going oh. to be augmented. <laughs> Sub Substantial. Astronomical. Astronomical, yeah, they've been so <laughs> kind. They drop off everything right in front of my door. They know I can't see people yet. I, Not only have they been kind, but now they're, they're in the danger zone because they're coming to your door. They could be on your doorknob. Uh, well, yeah. I live in a very big building. They're all wearing masks in the lobby where the concierge sits. It's roped off with caution tape. Mm, about, five, yeah. about five feet from where they sit. So no one can even approach them. I was shocked when I saw that. I didn't hear the joke. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, that ain't no joke, Jet. I say you got some paper if you got a concierge down in your building, man. Yeah, yeah. I ain't know what that's like. But Jeffrey uh, has done well over the years. He was in the medical field himself. He was mm -hmm. Nico, Nico, you were in my apartment, I believe. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was crazy. Yeah, crazy. So, so they, they, they've they just been very supportive. and and that's But the comedy community, I got to thank the comedy community. They've been so supportive. It's really amazing to, to realize that you're part of something that means so much. I, I, I really can't express it. I can't put it into words, but there were times that it literally brought me to tears while I was in the hospital. You guys made a, a video for me and I got so many messages. Ron Bennington announced my situation on his show on Sirius and I got hundreds and hundreds of messages from people. And I can't emphasize enough how much that means when you're sick. Corinne Fisher, who was a guest on our show one time, she, Corinne Fisher, she co-hosts Guys We Fuck podcast. Right. And she's also a good friend of Jeff Gurian. I don't know if you're one of the aforementioned guys that she's fucked or not, but. Uh, she, was my she was my assistant for a year and we're very, very close. Oh. And she, she and Harrison Greenbaum organized that video. Sweethearts. Sweethearts. Both of them. Corinne and Harrison on Facebook said, uh, if you have, uh, Corinne said, send a video, a well wishes for Jeff, uh, and send him to this email address. And then they, they put together a, uh, a video from all the well wishes and 
Um, so that was, you know, I don't know how many you got, but um, a lot. And it was any, really any amazing. Famous well wishes. Pardon me. Any famous well wishes? Yeah, I got well wishes from Nick Kroll and John Mulaney and Bill Burr and Jim Norton and uh, Bert Kreischer and Colin Quinn. They all posted like beautiful, really beautiful things that I, I'm telling you, a lot of it brought tears to my eyes. It really did. I, I'm not embarrassed to say that. It was very touching and very moving. Well, you know, you've got to, a lot of people say that they'd like to, you know, if only they could go to their own funeral, they would know how beloved they are. And you didn't actually have to die to get that kind of information. You just right. had to die. So it was, uh, it was something very special. You know, I, I think you'll get more out of Bill Burr de uh, um, sick than dead. <laughs> I was I was shocked at the at the at the nice message that he sent me. It was really. Uh, he's a, you know I'm kidding. He's a, he's listen. Well, it is it is, guys, it is a warm community. You're right. It is. Yeah. It is a warm community, and you find out more when you need it, because a lot of times it's guys just joking about each other. You know, busting each other's balls. Mm -hmm. You know, and but down deep there's a real caring, and it's a real community, and it's a it's a horrible way to have to find out. But it's a, very, right. it's a very heartwarming thing to find mm -hmm. out. We were talking I, about that with the GoFundMes and how generous people were uh, with some of the GoFundMe campaigns for comics and for comedy club staff. And mm -hmm. you've yeah. the comedy, Jeffrey, I don't know if you are aware of the Comedy Cellar GoFundMe, but that raised mm -hmm. over $100,000 for the Comedy Cellar wait staff and bar staff. I wasn't aware, but that's a, that's wonderful. That's amazing. You know, um, and a lot of a lot of the people that you just mentioned were also gave to that. So you know. Um, well, I'm not surprised. the The comedy cellar is in a class of its own. It always has been. It always will be. That's very nice. Uh, of you to say. Don't say it always will oh, be. No, and it's, bad it's luck. You know, I've been in the game for decades, and and it's the truth. You know, uh, you've transformed that whole area. Everything down there is Comedy Cellar, and it's, it's fantastic, and it's the greatest honor to sit at the table, you know, to be in the presence of those people. Uh, it's, it's just a fantastic thing, so I'm not surprised that it got the support that it got. It deserves it. And Noam, and I thank you again personally for the nice message that you sent me. I can't wait to be back at the Olive Tree. I, I, I was, I, yeah, I mean, the, the truth is, <laughs> I, yeah, I was very, I don't know, moved. I, I, you know, the, the <laughs> Nico thought I was, gonna, was gonna have like a jam. No, mm -hmm. that uh, I really, my heart went out to you uh, after what you had gone through prior and how you always maintain this sunny disposition. I and I really admire that. Um, our friend Hatem, who was in the hospital also with COVID, uh, who you know he he got it right a week after he had a heart transplant that he'd been waiting for for two years. Wow. In the heart, in the, in the transplant wing of the hospital. And now he, he's diagnosed with uh, coronavirus. And similar to you, he's just, you, you can't, you, you just can't get a bad word out of him. He, he's just, you know, I mean, I would just be, I would collapse. I know I would. And, um, yeah. you know, I mean, and, and he's like, he's writing me emails about new shows he wants to do. And it's like, it's just in a good mood. And I mean, and he seems to be recovering you know, he, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mean, I don't mean it like he's going to die or something. He's recovering nicely. But when he first got diagnosed, I mean, with all the, with all the um, stuff you hear about who's high risk, I mean, who could be higher risk than someone who just got a heart, got a heart transplant? Well, you know what? No, I'm, I'm glad you said that because it's very important to stay positive. That's something that I've always believed in for many years. I've tried to train myself that way. I have trouble doing that when things are going great. <laughs> That's the Jewish part of us. Do you know that while I was laying in the hospital, I was thinking of the Holocaust. And I'll tell you why I thought of it. I was so sick and I started thinking that there were people in the Holocaust who were probably as sick as I was and they, and they made them work in slave labor or they killed them. And I tell me about myself, it, fam. And I said to myself, I was that sick. <laughs> I would have been killed. There was no way that I could do any work. Feeling that sick. This, Jeffrey, look at me. Does this cheer you up? <laughs> yeah. <it's, it's, laughs> yeah. <laughs> it always cheers me up to see pictures of him. I think it's the, I think it's the mustache. No. Uh, <laughs> I really thought of that to try to give myself strength. I'm like, don't feel sorry. Did it work? There were people. Well, I survived. 
Through the grace of God, I survived. But I thought of things like that when I was laying there so sick. I said, there are people who have been just as sick and they made it. And I have to stay positive. I can't, I can't allow myself to go into a negative thought. And so, are, are you talking about Hatem Gaber? Yes, Hatem Gaber. Yeah. Yes, okay, so. There another Hatem? That's great. Yeah, there's not a lot of Hatems around. <laughs> uh, but that's a wonderful story. And I really, I truly believe that, that if you can, if you can train yourself to stay positive, you can get through almost anything. I have to do it. There's a, there's a ding that's going off every, every few minutes. A bing! And I don't know who that is or where it's coming from. But if anybody, you it's me. I don't if anybody has that. any yeah. insight, it really so, is. Uh, before we run out, it's not me. I, I turn away. So, so before, we, before we run out of time, I mean, Dan has a list of us. I just want to tell you, I, 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 I have trouble saying this, but you know, Bernie Fabricant is a friend of this uh, show. Outside Steve's brother. He's been reading Periel's book on my knees, and he tells me he can't put it down. That he that he that he just can't believe what a good book this is. <laughs> and he, he demands that I read it so I can ask you questions. I will read it, but he says there's one part there where you almost fuck Philip Roth. Is that true? Portnoy's complaint wasn't he like 90 years old? I have several things to say. First of all, the fact that you have still not read this book. Is no, I don't have that book. I, well, I, actually, I did buy it. I, I did buy it on Kindle, but I bought the other well, one. Whatever the fucking case may be. I mean, it's just shameful, okay? You want to know the answer? You can read the book. And he was not 90. No. Uh <laughs> and he was probably well into his late 70s by the time that I met him. And then and Try? What happened? Did I try? What happened? How, what, I mean, I, I know any, what, what Jewish writer, young girl, wouldn't fuck Philip Roth? I mean, come on, what, what, what happened? What went wrong? You have to read the book. Yo, she went the way! He's like the ultimate uh, uh, Jewish well, writer. You're a writer. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of our audience don't know who he is. Uh, he's I don't. He's from the Four 70s. Boys he's, I barely know. He's, he's, he's a well-known writer in the 70s and I guess early 80s. And his mm -hmm. books included Port Noise Complaint, Goodbye Columbus, The Plot Against America, and, and some other books. But who the hell reads novels anymore anyway? Let's anymore. See. That's a dead art. I mean, he's sort of like, I mean, you could say like the um, li literary lion of American. He was a big, he was a big figure in literary circles. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at that time. I, I mean, really, you know, I didn't think we'd get a conversation level. about Philip Roth. I wanted to talk about Periel. Oh, but he's not telling him. us about Philip Roth. And I just wanted to make it clear to the audience who Philip Roth is, that might actually lend to the story because not everybody is an old Jew. No, no offense. And <laughs> I, I would like to say one other thing is that Most people are old Jews, but if I any of you motherfuckers ever had to be pregnant, you want to talk about being nauseous for months and months on end. But it's supposed to be. But it's supposed okay. to be. Okay. It's supposed to be a sign of a healthy pregnancy. Right. Right. It's, it's supposed right to be. There. At I, least you get a baby when you're when you're pregnant. This you you're bringing in life. Jeffrey thought he was going to die, bro. I, I'm just psychologically, saying. it's a little bit easier to take when you know your life is not in danger. But yes, I'm sure it's right. horrifying. I would not have the baby. And if <laughs> I would, I would find a, a back alley play. I'm not fucking being nauseous for nine months. That's it. Yeah. No way. I can't. Nausea have. is one of the worst feelings, man. I get it in cars all the time. Oh, I get car it's sick so bad. It's so horrible. It's so horrible. Worst thing ever. It's the car fresheners. That pine thing kills me. Nico, we oh, haven't, I haven't seen oh, you in a while. I don't while. like that either. Yeah, in the taxis? Certain things. Yeah, in the taxis. It's horrible. I, I'll get out. What were you saying, Dan? I'm sorry. I'm saying, A, I haven't seen you in a while, so it's good to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, Likewise. I was just about to say that, Nico, that it's so good to mm. see you. I know Nico since, you he too, started in, since he started in comedy. When me and Jordan Rock used to host The Late Show at The Strip, and you used to come by yeah. as a teenager with mm -hmm. uh, Amina Imani. We used to hang out in the back. Yeah, man. You met me, I was what, four years in? Because I was 18 when we met. As a matter of fact. Yeah, and so great yeah. to see 
doing so well, man. Amazing. I appreciate you, brother. Nico, you're Nico, a, you were I, funny I from the get-go. Thank you. Um, Nico, you know, uh, he's pretty new to the comedy cellar, and his existence actually uh, worried me because I went to see the, I went to the New York Comedy Club. That's where it was, Nico, right? New York Comedy That's Club? That's where it was. Mm-hmm. Everyone said, well, I'll go to another comic club. And I saw my say, I said, why the fuck is this guy not working at the cellar? I didn't even mm-hmm. know about him. You never, for whatever reason, put, you know, it's not, not that you have to, but like you never really made yourself known to us in any way that I knew about. You know, it's funny. Yeah. I've been coming around there for years, man. Well, I mean, okay, but <laughs> no, but that, I mean, because you came around doesn't mean I would know about you, know about you, right. you know? yeah. Right. And people are, people are intimidated. Wonder, to just Perry else, tells me I should show the picture of your album. Let me do it. But I, I always wonder, like, who like else is out there that that I don't that I don't know about? You know? Oh man, few people, bro. Few people. What am I looking at? Did it freeze? No, so, no, no. We're. Oh, okay. Can't you do it, Perry? Okay, hold on. I'll do it. I mean, for the love of God, Noam. What, what I okay, but I mean, I, okay, I'm okay, 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 just hold on a second. But like, while I'm talking, okay, uh, play, 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 talking points and bio, okay, and here is the, the picture. And now I am sharing the screen, share advanced portion of screen, okay, and I'm putting the portion of the right there. There he is, boom, there it is, there it is. boom. Well, let me, the Kang, yeah, why is it called Mar- Marcellus? Is that the name of the guy in uh, Pulp Fiction, Marcellus? Oh, no, no. Marcellus is just my middle name. And it's one of the... I don't tell a lot of people you wouldn't know unless you were close to me. The only people that know that's my middle name are like my parents and my brother, right? So in a weird way, this is my way of going. If you know my middle name, that means you're closer to me. And the only reason you would look this up is if you're a fan of mine or if you're, you just so happen to hear it. You only ever look deep into it to find out who I am because you hopefully like me. So... You know, I'm a middle name, you're close to me. That's the reason behind the title. But Marcellus is an awesome name. Like, that, that could be a great you, man. name in itself. That could be, that yeah. could be a single name. Like, you could just be Marcellus. Yes. Exactly. Could be. Yeah. Could be, but I, I'm, I'm used to Nico White now, man. But Nico I can't is change it. Name too. There's no other Nico anyway. Yeah, no, it's just me. Um, it's me and Nico Case, the folk singer. That's, that's my competition. And the Japanese cat. But outside of that, Nico. just us three. <laughs> Nico, Bro, that was a. I'm sorry, Dan. What? No, let Nico go ahead, Nico. No, I was just gonna say for like seven years it was me and the Nico in Japanese means cat. So for years the Japanese anime fetish was a lot more famous than I ever was. So whenever you would look me up, that would come up for like 25 pages before I would. Now I'm in the lead, but it's still there. It's still holding strong. And you know, it's funny. I was in Japan in October. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're obsessed with cats. Every place Bro. you go, cats. They're selling yeah. cats all over the. I I was shocked. I didn't know that before I went. They sell headphones over there for like the company makes about a hundred million dollars a year. That has the Neko um the cat ears on them. They make a killing off of that stuff, bro. Yeah, that Hello like, Kitty giant Hello over there. Kitty, yeah, it's it's crazy over there. I I couldn't believe it. Well, there's mm-hmm. the, the big fetish scene. I actually did a couple I, of shows over there. And you know they have no comedy clubs over there. It's all bar really? shows. All bar shows. If you opened a comedy cellar there, it would kill. They would do oh. it really well because there's no comedy clubs. Mm-hmm. It's only bar shows. There was one. Tom Rhodes told me about a club. I, I got. That's that's very quick shaky logic there. <laughs> I mean, this is that's like saying, you know, there's no Jewish delis in Harlem. If you would open a Jewish deli in Harlem, you'd make a killing. You'd be the only one. <laughs> no, because the people there, yeah, it's not Japanese people. There's a lot of expats. Oh, okay, and they go to the shows. Yeah, the mm-hmm. Japanese people, they, someone once smiled and thought better of it. It's not a big thing over there. But, <laughs> someone once smiled and thought better of it. <laughs> what? <laughs> but it was too late to take it back. Someone, someone else saw it and it was over. Well, you know, comedy is spreading around the world. It wouldn't surprise me if it, if it hit Japan one of these days. I mean, maybe it never will, but... Well, they have shows, <laughs> but they don't have an actual club. Well, I'm They're saying, all upstairs I'm saying, and bars. I'm saying if, if the Japanese people themselves start doing comedy uh, mm-hmm. in Japan, in Japanese, that might happen one day. I'm assuming that they don't have much of that now, but... No, but the ones that do come over here, you know, Rome Kanda? Right. Like, 
He was a, a Japanese comedian that hosted an American game show. There's a, there's a few Japanese comedians that came over, mm -hmm. but in Japan, there's a lot of ex expats. The shows that I did, people from Scotland and Ireland and England, mm -hmm. a lot of them, and they come, but again, there's no comedy club. Well, Good Heavens was one that Tom Oates told me about, and it's tr really just a bar. But like, the mm -hmm. to the, part of the secret to the comedy cellar is the uh, attention that Noam gives to it, which he could not give to a club in, in, Japan, right? in Japan. Nor could SD be involved, nor would it have the same atmosphere, nor would it have drop-ins. Uh, well, what about the comedy cellar in Las Vegas? That's not in China. Not, not China, in Japan. Well, the comedy cellar in Las Vegas is fine, but it's not at the same level as the Comedy Cellar in New York. It's a fine- Oh, nothing could be. Yeah, nothing could be. It would just be a franchise. It would be a name. I wouldn't expect Noam to be going to Japan. It's a really long trip, by the way. 14 hours on a plane, you want to kill yourself by the time you get there. You want to commit Hari Kiri. <laughs> But, uh, that's, why, that's why they bombed Pearl Harbor, you know, by the way, because it was only six you, hours away. They don't want to you just, you just going in with whatever you got left, huh? Aren't you, don't you have sufficient means, Jeffrey, to fly business class at this point? I did fly. Uh, I flew, you know, what's the, what's the thing? It was uh, not economy, supreme economy. I don't remember what they call it. <laughs> it was a big ripoff. It was like two grand <laughs> and my seat didn't even work. Supreme economy. That's it was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> 14 hours in the air. There's no place that's worth going forth. I had a good time. It was interesting. Su Supreme <laughs> economy is what I'm stuck on. Yeah, I think that's what they called it or something like that. Higher class peasantry. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it was no, a very, I, very I, strange I, place. Listen, I'm, I'm one hour away from my Google alerts on Tara Reid and Joe Biden. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my mind. What, what's, <laughs> well, no, I'm just uh, quickly. Um, have you been, and speaking of Vegas, have you been in touch with the people at the Rio Hotel? Because obviously that's been oh. down there too. So what's going on in Vegas? When did they want to open back up? Because it would be up to them, I think, the Rio Hotel people more than you at this point, would it not? Well, it's all shut down. I, I, have no, I haven't heard from them. So I, I, I hope they'll give me a heads up. I, I don't know. I know that's a boring answer. Uh, okay, uh, maybe you can the truth. with him, but I, I, I'm very pessimistic about Comedy Cellar Vegas. I got to tell you, I don't know how that's going to get back off the stretcher. Oof. It wasn't on this. I mean, <laughs> why are you more? Uh, Bro, I'm telling you, between between like Gnome de Blasio, I don't know if I'm going to have a hairline left when this is over, dog. <laughs> why? <laughs> y'all, y'all, you. How you feel about? Hey man, look, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It might, it might be all right. It might not be. No, the thing is, that the cellar in New York, um, we can we can cut back in many ways. We, God forbid, we could pay less, have fewer comedians, lower the prices, all kinds of stuff we can do. In Vegas, we got to fly people out there. We got to pay for hotel rooms. We gotta, you gotta. I mean, we don't. We only have we have five people and. and if nobody comes, we're fucked. Right. Um, and I don't know. I mean, hopefully it'll come back. The truth is, like, I don't care. Like, I, I hope it comes back. I'm just worried about New York. Yeah. I'm worried about, you yeah, know, I, I need to survive. But um, if, I, if I, I, I went into Vegas knowing I could lose it just as a gamble. So if, if it doesn't come back, it'll lick my wounds. But it's not going to, you know, it, it's really not going to, it'll roll off my back. But. If New, if New York doesn't come back, what am I going to do? Uh, New York's coming back. Stop New York's coming that. back. Didn't you hear a word Jeffrey just said? Actually, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of words. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> no, of course I heard. What, 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 what does that mean? He doesn't know it's coming back. It's Listen, I will say this. Everybody needs to wear masks. I've been, I've been doing a lot of research. I sent it to Dan. There, there, there is research out there which indicates that if everybody wears masks, we could bring the R naught, which is the number of the, the frequency with which it, uh, it's transmit, it's tra transmits, transmit it. Yeah, the transmissible frequency um, below one, which would mean mm. if you s sustain it below one, the virus becomes extinguished. And it seems like I asked Tyler about this a week ago, but since then I, I think I was right that if we had been wearing masks since like February, we mm -hmm. have maybe one. Tenth, the death, the death. Yeah, that's what yeah. That is and yeah. And instead, they're so, and I feel like they're so enamored with these high tech 
fancy solutions. It's like the doctors didn't think about gravity and, and laying people on their stomachs. You know, when that, that, that came through, it, yeah. they all the fancy machines lie people on their stomachs. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people survive because their heart wasn't on top of their lungs. And I think it's similar with masks. Like, we got so caught up in trying to find a drug and testing and contact tracing and all this. I was like, wait a second. We, let's take full advantage of the technologies we already have. Masks. Everybody for months, masks. for months they were telling us we didn't even need masks. That's for crazy. months, for months they were like, "Oh no, that that's too much. Masks are only for people that are sick." My mom was in here like, "Oh yeah, we gotta we gotta order masks." And I'm listening to the news like, "Go, nah, they saying that's only for sick people." Then, oh yeah, you now require everybody to have on a mask before you can come inside. How yeah, many people got sick it. in the meantime? Well, that's the thing because nobody really knows for sure. What bothers me is that they're trying to put out this stuff about this drug Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, yeah. it works, it works. Like, but it know, sounds dangerous, dangerous though. People, but because they haven't done long-term studies, they're afraid to say that it works. There are some hospitals that are using it on a regular basis and mm -hmm. some hospitals don't have it at all. Mm -hmm. But you don't and, know that it works, I mean. Well, I could only talk from my own experience. It seemed to work on me and mm -hmm. it seemed to work on a lot of people that I've been reading stories about. They Jeffrey, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I mean, but it seems to me, you're a man of science, that you understand that a lot of people, most people don't die from this. So whatever you happen to be taking could be blueberry juice at the time that you get better, you will likely think, oh, I, it's blueberry juice, I got better. But oh, I understand what you're saying. It could be coincidental, but you were, you were never likely to die. Even though it felt like you liked it. it no, no. Like it I, I didn't have any side effects from taking the drug. Yeah. And they said that one of the potential side effects could be an irregular heartbeat. Yeah. I, I didn't happen to experience that. And it's you know, I, I asked for a cardiologist and they wouldn't send one. They said that I didn't need it, that they, they felt that I should only deal with pulmonary specialists. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not saying, it, and I, I hope no, it doesn't work. Nobody knows work. for sure, but it would be nice there, there are enough cases where people have gotten better using that combination mm -hmm. yeah. of hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and z yeah. mm -hmm. And I, re I really believe that because, because I was on the, the z for 10 days, they didn't give me more in the hospital. Well, there's a story today now that uh, there's gonna be, they're going to release the um, information about the remdesivir, and that's going to be a, p a positive trial, that it, mm -hmm. that, it was, that it worked. And I think I read it quickly. I think they've only releasing the data about the people who were far along. So we don't even know. Like the suspicion is that these drugs have a better shot of working if you if they are uh, administered early before the viral load is basically so high that it overwhelms the drug, which is similar uh -huh. to antivirals and stuff. So yeah, I mean, if, if they can get a therapy or two that really works, plus masks, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, maybe we can go back to work. You know, but yeah. I don't know. I'll tell you one people are go, when this is all over, people are going to go crazy. There's going to be celebrations like the end of World War II. Oh, a uh, uh, hundred percent. They'll be kissing nurses in the street. Well, <laughs> before we go, we're quite as abruptly. I mean, World War II, we they're like, okay, Japan surrenders. There was a moment in time that was precise. This so, is not likely to be quite as. As, as exact, like, like a date, like, yeah, so, there won't be a date when you say it, it ended on uh, May 15th. They're not going to be like a date. You, you all know this, right? That the, the guy, that famous picture, World War II, with the guy holding the woman making out in Times Square, you know that yeah, picture? he's kissing an nurse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, he, he was canceled, that guy. Was it really? Yeah, because it turned, yes, out, she, it turns out she reported that she didn't know the guy. He just oh. got her. Uh, he, he just grabbed her uh, on the street. Yo, like a sexual harasser. <laughs> right, it became an iconic picture, and it turned out she didn't know the guy. I just want to meet the person who dug that deep. Oh, so funny. Um, by the way, and last thing is that so, and um, my my ne my latest prediction is that Joe Biden is going to be pressured to release his um, uh, papers at the University of Delaware, wherever they are. That he you know he won't release the senator senator papers. Because, mm -hmm. um, and I think the argument is going to be that, well, if you want Trump to release his tax returns, and that's mm -hmm. his private financial data, why can't, wh who says a senator can seal his, sen his papers, work product of when he was a public servant, right? Mm -hmm. And because this woman who claims that he harassed her says that she filed a complaint and it would be in his papers. And ah. 
no, no, we're, there's, the papers are sealed until two years after his retirement. <laughs> well, then unseal them, right? You're running for president. Right. So that's going to be awesome. I can't wait to, I think, I mean, he may not release them, but mm -hmm. the hypocrisy no, it has no bottom limit when it comes to politics. Just no bottom limit. Yeah. Do, do you think that Biden will be forced to uh, abandon the race? Me like I don't I don't I don't know I don't know that old man isn't fit to be president dog just in looking at him you can tell he's not healthy his social media team is kicking ass though the promo that they put out against Trump at the start of the um Corona stuff amazing the actual debate though he's gonna get killed every time because he can't, say, can't put thoughts together. I would say it's hard to believe it's hard to predict that he that he will leave the race, but. I do have this always feeling like, well, if it makes sense, whatever makes the most sense, that's what's most likely to happen, Is even though it's hard to, and I think that given how uh, bad he looks right now, mm -hmm. and what a weak candidate he is, they will, and the far left will move, put pressure on him to resign from the race. The question is- But well, who's next? Well, that's the thing, because the Dem the, the main, most of the Democratic Party will, would like to skip over Sanders, and bring in Cuomo or some somebody under the age of 65 who uh, has yeah. mainstream appeal. But the Sanders, you know, crew is going to freak the fuck out if they pass if, if they pass over uh, Ber uh, Sanders for some other candidate. So I would say that if Sanders weren't around, I would say the chances would be much higher that Ber that Biden will drop out. Mm -hmm. But I, I'd say it's 50-50 or maybe even 60-40 that he will be asked to leave because the, the, the female running mates mm -hmm. who are all going to have these quotes about how they were so upset about Kavanaugh and how you have to believe all women and blah, blah, blah. And you have this really strong case of this woman who told like five people 27 years ago that Biden did this to her, you know, or so, over, over 27 years. Um, how are they going to explain that away? Like, I don't think it should be, I don't think it's fair to him, but they, they, they made their whole career the last two years about saying that you have to believe all women. Mm -hmm. Well, most, what did most, he supposedly do? What did he, I haven't read any accounts that were specific about he, what he supposedly he did. He says that in the, in, in the office, he, she, she, he sent her to get her, his gym bag or something. She brought it back and uh, he digitally raped her, put his fingers inside her. Um, you know, you, her, you know what? Wow. Uh, uh -huh. I guess you will. And <laughs> she told what? her mother called Larry King and talked about how her daughter was had a problem with the senator. Her neighbor says she remembers the story 20 years ago. Her brother says she rem he remembers Has the story. Another friend remembers the story. I mean, Has it been verified, by the way, that that woman who called Larry King was indeed Tara Reed's mother? Well, it's, yes, I would say it has been because she said my mom was on Larry King about it. They mm -hmm. found this tape and he identifies her. He says, you know, he says the town first. He's like, Lana Luna, California, go, which is where her mother lived. It was lived. Bispo, I think. And it was a small town. I mean, you're, the, 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 how could it not be her mother? So, and then there's, the Bispo, and then, there's another little known thing. A, a, a journalist named Alexander Cockburn wrote a, a story <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was a pretty famous journalist, and he wrote a story in the 90s where he said that multiple people within the Biden office had told him about Joe Biden sexually harassing them while his wife was sick or, or having a baby or something like that. His wife was in a hospital for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> he says there's multiple people telling him that. So there's, and of course, there's so much footage of this guy snipping hair and rubbing shoulders. And I mean, I mean listen, let me tell you something, Periel. That is sexual. Anytime a dude is sniffing your hair or rubbing your shoulders, he's getting off on it. Don't let them fucking tell you otherwise. Me and all the guys on this panel, we've had dicks all our lives. <laughs> We're going to tell you, I'm not sniffing any girl. Sniffing hair. Yeah. Because I feel really friendly to her. You, that is just <laughs> a little ridiculous thing. And they, and they say this stuff, and feminist women, because they want to support the Democratic Party, they're like, Oh yeah, yeah. He's just, he's just being you know friendly, just a friendly old guy <laughs> snipping hair. You know how you know how old guys do. It's a, it's they, they they suspend their disbelief. He's a creep. He's okay, a creep. But, but to be fair, 
you know, I am being fair. What you're about to say is not going to be fair, but go ahead. If there's a spectrum <laughs> of sexual assault, right? Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Then yeah. I would say that sniffing hair, you know, is relatively innocuous. No, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. I mean, it is, it, it, this is what bothers me about it. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Sniffing hair to a stranger, which can tell you to go fuck yourself, that may be more innocuous or friend or whatever. Sniffing hair when you're a senator and you have a captive audience and you know they won't fucking do anything because, because they can't, because you're a position of power. That fucking enrages me. I used to I talk about this. guys are fucking actually raping people with their penis. Okay, penis, what I'm telling you, right? I, I said he's a creep. I didn't compare it to rape. All I'm, right, so I'm saying, I'm saying that, you know what? I'll sniff hold on. If, if I'm saying that if I, if I sniff one of my waitress's hair, <laughs> And she's like totally skeeved out, but she has to put Skeeve. up with it because she doesn't want to lose her job. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's not a minor thing, actually. I, I think she'd be more upset if you fingered her against her will. Yeah, that's yeah, more upset. Yeah. That's, also, you were that's what the campaign is going to, that's what the campaign is going to become. He's accused of that too. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I is. guess what I, my point I was making is that it, this, this shouldn't be as hard to believe as some people are making it because he does have a pattern of really kind of creepy, inexplicable behavior with women. It's not like you say, like, oh my God, he's never shown any signs of like crossing lines with women. You know what? Donald Trump has like actually raped people though, if I'm not- Oh, kidding. has he? Yeah. But yeah. see, th this is what it's gonna become. It's gonna be people on one side gone, but yours is worse than ours. Yours is worse than Trump. First of all, I, you don't have any, Donald Trump is no more guilty of rape than Biden is. But second of all. Excuse me, have you read the excerpt from his ex wife's book when he was like tearing her hair out and my pity? She retracted that. She retracted that. My favorite part of this is seeing, seeing all of you guys after so long and knowing not a thing has changed. But, but this is my <laughs> point. Just to be very clear, I don't think it's fair to bring up these allegations against any, certainly not an ex-wife. Even Chris, you know, Chris Rock's talking about that. Ex-wives, that, that is the least reliable thing you're oh, going to well, Chris Rock said it, then it must be true. Yes, I would, <laughs> I would say that. But anyway, um, I don't think it's fair to bring up these accusations, tw 25, 27 years. I don't think it's fair. Of hair but sniffing or rape? Anything. What I'm saying is that the... The, the liberal world for the last two years has been telling us, including Joe Biden, you have, if a woman makes the allegation, you believe her. You are, you are a monster if you don't. Doesn't matter that Christine, that, that Blasey Ford had not a single piece of evidence against Kavanaugh, not a single piece, including ever, no one that you ever actually met him, was in the same room with him. The mm -hmm. fact that she said it, that meant you had to believe it and if you didn't believe it, you couldn't even say it out loud. I was afraid to say anything skeptical out loud. So and this now? is this is their standard, and and it is certainly fair to hold somebody to their own standard. And and that's why the Repu like they're the, like I mean Woody Allen was actually cleared by law enforcement. Now I happen to think he he might have done it, but he was cleared by law enforcement, right? Mm -hmm. Um, he they major publishers dropped his book. Amazon dropped him just on an accusation. Yeah. <laughs> an accusation that was investigated and the people who investigated found it, no, that we don't see evidence here. Well, this, I, is, this is the standard and the same people who dropped Woody Allen's book and won't, and won't publish, uh, dropped his show and won't publish his book, they will be voting for Joe Biden and you're gonna see them twist logic into a pretzel to explain why it, it, it's different and it's no different. Everybody knows it's no different. Everybody knows. Some guy just lost his job on TV for asking uh, a, a woman there, are you going out tonight? Because he come in what? dress. She was wearing a nice dress and he said to her, are you going out tonight? And she was offended by that. Chris Matthews was forced to resign after all those years for saying right. to a girl, you look so pretty. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Chris Matthews, that's who it was. And then he followed up by saying, are you going out tonight? Mm -hmm. And she said she was so offended by that. Reality. Those that's are the people who have to tell me why it's okay with Joe, the, the accusation goes Joe Biden. Not the Trump supporters. Not the, it's those people, the ones who were calling for Chris Matthews' head and all this. this the, I mean, like, can I be honest why I get so upset about it? The fucking yeah. people who were threatening my kids on Facebook, threatening my kids, threatening mm. violence against me and my family because we had the nerve to put Louis C.K. on stage. 
Louis, who only admitted to masturbating in front of women, never, he said, I always ask permission. He never admitted to doing it without permission. But either way, those same people who are going to vote for Joe Biden, despite all this accusation, they were ready to come at me and threaten my, my I don't say threaten my life, but yeah, threaten to firebomb the club, threaten my kids. That's, that's threatening our lives, Noam, because they need yeah. it. Fucking, these fucking hypocrites. I, I mean, I can't tell you how much I hate them. Mm -hmm. Fucking hypocrites. How horrible. Uh, Perry, is that noise coming there. from your apartment? There's some noise in the background. Nico, are those your neighbors? I'm hearing, I'm hearing neighbors or roommates or something. Let me see. I put myself on mute, see if you don't hear. No, it's not me. I'm alone here. You know how much hate mail I got? Like how many nasty things from, that Joe, is Biden, from that is so from Joe Biden? There are so many sick people in the world who use their anonymity on the internet to, to say the most vile things, the, the innermost workings of their mind, so sick, it's unbelievable. <laughs> see it on YouTube, like cancel comments all the time. They're not they, all anonymous. I mean, Alyssa Milano was very outspoken about uh, Me Too and, and has been far more silent with regard to Joe Biden. Um, Hold on, I, I, I need something to calm me down. Hold on a second, I'm, I'm really upset. <sighs> Yeah, don't you feel better now? Noam is a weird uh, obsession with Adolf Hitler. Um, if you're only hearing the audio, oh, Hitler's back. No, <laughs> video of Hitler in in, in the. Ah! And then there's Louis <laughs> I'm still trying. I'm still trying to figure out how a guy named Cockburn ever grew up. How the fuck? It, by the way, it, it, is it probably Alexander rough. Alexander Cockburn, if you remember him from the ah. That's a tough name to get to grow up with. Cockburn. Is that Trump on the helmet? Sure is. Yeah, it was at the Wailing Wall. Mm -hmm. um, Wailing Wall. Anyhow, Noam, is there any other business uh, we need to uh, discuss? No, uh, no, no. Wrap this up. Oh, this kind of brings together. This is from a. Uh, this brings together a little of our, of our Japanese uh, talk and uh, election. Correction in progress. Oh, is that China? Is that China? Or, uh, Japan? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> There's a really China. funny site called Ing you can see their Ing uh, it's just backwards English English.com English and they and they collect all these funny you know uh, bad translations. <laughs> translations. Yeah, yeah. So this one says erection in progress and it's a construction site. No, it's oh, like election, election, election. Oh, erection. It was construction. That's what I got from that sign. No, right. it's supposed to be election in progress. Oh, no, no, repost that sign, please. Oh. But Erect, why, why would they spell, no, but it. Oh, you might be right. You might be right. I, I you know what, I, 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 uh, I remember that old joke was a Japanese girl's favorite holiday, Erection Day. But you're not supposed to say that joke, but that's what that, I, so I took it to be an erection, but yeah. Yeah. It's probably a construction site, that, because that, that would be a, a, a weird translation of construction site. I just want to say, I just repeating the joke that I used to hear, I never approved of it. Even when I was young, I, I bothered me that they would joke like that. Mm -hmm. but that was the joke back in the day. You know, they would make those jokes. Did anybody see, has anybody seen Team America lately? Why, why <laughs> is that joke offensive to you? Because Japanese do have problems with that or Chinese people with that, uh, pronouncing that letter. Because somebody got fired for making that, you know, or, or, or that accent joke. But th Team America, I would go out, I saw it recently. I mean, they just go to town on making fun of the Asian accent with Kim Jong-il. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm so, and if you put on the, you got to put on the subtitles, the closed captions when you watch it, because it mm -hmm. spells everything in English. Things like you don't even really hear it. It is so yeah. funny. But if you're, if you make fun of a uh, German accent or, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a French accent or an English accent, of course, it's okay. We know why that is, because those are white people. Mm -hmm. Make of that what you will. I'm not defending or saying otherwise, but you can make fun of an English accent until you're blue in the face. As you recall Austin Powers where, where uh, Mike Myers, you know, he had those buck teeth and those bad teeth. <laughs> Ew, how do you do, you know? And, and, and all those silly expressions. How's your father? Hey, we're good Roger. <laughs> <laughs> people but, love when you can imitate an accent, but Giannis Pappas told me that he got death threats for doing a Greek accent when he does Mr. Panos. Mr. Panos? And he's Greek. Yeah. So how sick is that? That you're not even allowed to imitate your own ethnicity's accent. It's just, it's insane. Well, I got to say that is cheeseburger, cheeseburger. 
Well, yeah, and I, and, and it plays Russell, because Russell Peters, Russell Peters imitates every accent in the world, and people love him. It's the mm -hmm. same hypocrisy. It's the exactly. same fucking hypocrisy. They don't really care. The same fucking hypocrisy. Nobody wants to see anybody mean to somebody. We all get that, and 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 there are certain things. There's many kinds of jokes that will make us all uncomfortable. But but you know, they, what do they want? Knock knock jokes. You really think they want everybody to return to knock knock jokes? Like well, right. what? What, you're supposed to use your intuition. People know if you're coming from a place of love or a place of hatred. People mm -hmm. can tell that. They know for sure. And then and they, they, know, they were so outraged until Chappelle came out with his special and that not one person had the nerve to say a peep of, of, among, among the people we know. The people who were mm -hmm. blasting Louis, you know, blasting everybody. Uh, hello, Mr. Chappelle. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, of course, Michael Jackson's victims were all full of shit and shit. They should, of course, they should be happy that, that Michael molested them. Of course, Mr. Chappelle. Right? Right this way, Mr. Chappelle. I mean, yeah. what fucking hipper? And, and, you know, I'm not knocking Chappelle. I love this. Yeah, yeah. Of course what not. Hippers. They, they shut up when Chappelle did it. They shut it up when Biden does it. It changes when they like you. If they like you, then it's fine. I can forget, I can forgive the um, transgressions of my ally. That's how it is. Yeah, you know I mean, if they feel like you're on their side, they all with you. The second you're not on their side, though, it's scathing. Yeah. And they killed Shane Gillis. Poor guy. All right, I got to go. Okay, folks. Uh, all we're right. Asking, uh, thank you, Jeffrey, for joining us and sharing your harrowing tales. Uh, and how thank you for having me. It was great to see all you guys. Really, really yeah, great. Where thank you. Can everybody find Brother, it's great to see you. At me, yes, at commiesdover.com. Also, okay. Carielle's collecting uh, Chinese children's books. So, so send her some children's books for her, for her son. How's he doing with those books? That, uh, we've read already three or four of them. That was so nice of you. No one left me. I, you know, I left the city about a month ago, and I didn't bring anything with me. And I started becoming very concerned that my son is going to be illiterate. So. I, have, I only have a half hour to eat before my intermittent fasting window is closed. So I would like to move this along. Hey, where can we find, <laughs> where can we find your album, Nico? All right. You can find my album on everywhere where you can buy albums. iTunes, Spotify, if you're streaming. You can um, go, to, go to my website, NicoWhite.com. That's N-E-K-O-W-H-I-T-E dot C-O-M. The album comes out May 8th, my birthday. Pick it up, say hi, let me know which parts you like. Okay, thank you, everybody. We'll I wish I could be that smooth. I didn't get a chance <laughs> to get my, my uh, site. Me. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, Jeff Zurian. I got it. ComedyMattersTV.com and on YouTube, YouTube.com slash ComedyMattersTV. Lots of interviews with everybody you love in comedy. Thank yes. you so much for having me on. Yes, God bless back. you, Jeffrey. We're happy you're back. Thank you so much, Norman. It means so much to me. Thank you, guys. Thank all you. love to y'all. Good to see everybody, all right? Be safe. Nico, be Good safe. to see you, too, Nico. Thank you, Periel. Lots of love. Hey. And you can email podcast at comedyseller.com and follow us on Instagram at live from the table. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you Bye. soon.